Um, but yeah, so so glad you guys went up and looked at all the posters. Uh, I think it's a great exercise. Um, I usually have you guys look at those posters and then look at the um, bio grad student posters just down the hall um, mm -hmm. as a sort of compare contrast. Um, and uh, I'll just say when I when when this was all when. I'm old enough that when we started doing this, we used to, everything was made on, or for, for oral presentations, public presentations, everything was on 35 millimeter slides. So you had to make your stuff early. And the easiest thing was to take a photograph of your paper. So you'd, you'd make a, a graph and then you, and then you would develop that film that was 35 millimeter film. So you develop it and then you literally put that piece of film into a cardboard thing and that would go into your slide rack. And so because of that, the technology was such that everybody did white background with black lines. And then when I was in grad school, PowerPoint started coming up and it was a hugely divisive thing. Color, like using color, like what? Like that's such BS, that's such advertising, Madison Avenue. It's like not real science. And so um, I'll just say that the tastes evolve over time, tastes evolve over time. And so stuff I'm going to talk about, especially... Um, early on here is, is, is I think pretty robust and pretty general, but of course there's always exceptions to the rule. And as you guys work on your poster and your, your visualizations, you know, you're going to have, you know, reasons why um, you want to choose color X or shape Y. And those are all cool. Key thing is to make sure it's intentional, to make sure it's intentional and to make sure it's really effective communication. And so, so the best thing there is to show it to your buds, show it to some friends, see if that, see if it makes sense, etc. And so again, you guys, please interrupt me if something doesn't make sense or I go too fast or whatever. But in general, what you guys are doing now with with this stage of you know ha starting to have this data and starting to figure out how to do communicate this data, basically fundamentally, we're talking about how does one thing relate to another, and maybe it's how does one thing relate to several other things, but fundamentally, we're trying to look for a pattern here. Um, and that gets down to your hypothesis, right? That's why um, Professor Spees and Steele uh, uh, spend so much time with you guys. So what's your hypothesis? What are you thinking about? How can we test this? What can we tweak? Um, and initially, when you're first starting your project, you're like, well, I want to do this, this, this. And they might have been, or I might have been, or your other advisors might have been, yeah, let's kind of keep it a little narrow. And you're like, no, 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 I want to do this. The narrower, the better when it comes to making these types of uh, figures and, and data visualizations. So the first thing, let's do some interaction. So everybody needs to uh, uh, pay attention and not go to sleep. So um, so some of you might have seen this in one of my other classes, but but this is a, a figure that I like to use. So, so have a look at this and tell me what you think... Um, this figure is trying to tell us. If you have seen this exact example before, maybe you can be quiet, but everybody else, tell me what you think we're, we're trying to visualize here. And anybody can unmute and, and chime in. Maybe a uh, rainfall. Okay, so maybe, maybe something about uh, moisture levels, precipitation, something like that. Okay, cool. Other thoughts or other guesses? Doesn't it say how many costumes there are in each area? Mm -hmm. So something about costumes. Cool. Any other, uh, well, maybe one more guess. It's so exciting. I'm not sure, but maybe like temperature. No, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's rainfall. Maybe it's costumes. So, so why is it hard? <clears throat> Why is it hard for you guys to figure this out, right? It's labeled poorly, right? So we don't have um, all the variables explained. We have some stuff um, plotted in, in, in you know, dimensional space here, but, but we're not entirely sure what is being plotted, right? So there's some, it looks like there's some, so there's some geographic something. We have West, Central, and East, okay? Um, got that. And, and there's the, the legend there and the numbers, there's some numbers over there that go from uh, low or zero to, you know, 30 some odd number, but that's about it, right? So, um, so this is a poorly designed figure. The, the people aren't sure what you're trying to communicate. They can't tell what, what is gray versus white or, or whatever. So this is a, a redo of the same data. Does this make more sense now? Yeah. And what and what and so so what do we so now we're looking at right it's pretty obvious now we're looking at uh, mascot costumes from minor league baseball uh, folks um, we've so a couple things have happened here and you guys could probably see many of these but so first and foremost when we have a, a, a X Y plot like this or a, a two dimensional two axis plot 
we want to label what the variable is um, and then the units. So in the case of, of the y-axis here, it's the volume of the costume that was being shown. Very weird thing, right? It's not precipitate, not, not, not rainfall or something, but kind of weird. But so it's, so the variable is volume. The units, the, the things we counted, uh, that was cubic meters. Okay, so we put the, the general default is to put the units in parentheses. Um, and, uh, and then we also had three different colors before. Unclear what those three different colors meant. Um, but, you know, it's, it's enough to have the X variable labeled as West, Central, and East. And, we can, and so we can see that. And then lastly, we have, uh, I don't know what those bars are. What are those bars? Is that the max? Is that the number of people that showed up? What is it? And so we look on the um, either in the X, either in the label or in a, a call out box to, to help us understand what's going on. Very, very common is you guys will say um, uh, average or, or costume, average costume volume or something like that. No. Right. You usually don't put the statistic in in the label of this guy. Um, and so instead, we need to tell people what it is. So the bar is a mean. So the top of this bar would be the average value and plus one standard deviation. So, OK, I get it. So now I can start to understand what the the things being plotted are. I can understand what the what the numbers are. I can, and I can start to myself start to test that hypothesis that we're being that we're being um, that's being offered up. Cool. Make sounds good. Okay, here's another example. So this is from the Wall Street Journal. Awesome newspaper. You guys should all subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. Fantastic journalism. One of the best newspapers uh, in our country. The opinion section is psycho. The opinion section is right-wing insanity, right? Um, so this example I'm showing you is from the opinion section. This is not the news generating. There's, there's a strong wall between the news and the opinion. So let me just say that. So this is an example from several years ago when, when President Obama was our president. And if you look on the left, it is this is the text that was in, in the newspaper. And it's basically it's about there is a contentious thing here about, um, about policy. And, and there was a proposal to do some uh, uh, taxation. And so um, from this, from this uh, uh, op-ed, um, basically it was, it was saying that President Obama asked the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans to pay a little more and some stuff. But the mathematical reality is that Washington will need to soak the middle class because that's where the money is. And, and that little graph right there, where am I going on? That little graph right there is right here. So this is the figure they, they, they offer up to, to show that actually, in fact, the people that are paying the most taxes are the middle class. So what, tell me what you think about this figure. Is this, is this a robust figure, good figure, bad figure? What do you guys think? Mm, I might have switched the two um, sides to make it a bit easier to read, like the horizontal on oh, the left. Okay. Possibly. Okay, possibly. So maybe maybe we could do some axis flipping. Okay. Anything else? An an issue with this figure or anything else you guys like or dislike about it? I just um I always prefer it. I always prefer when the axes are labeled, even though it gives us the units within the graph. Yeah. So I have a couple examples of this uh, later on. So so um I would say newspapers have been um uh one of the leaders in in sort of doing sort of trimming and tightening up um, of figures. So, so in this case, it's the y-axis is trillions of dollars. Um, and so they just put 1.4 trillion and, and didn't put, like Stephen has suggested, actually like label it as dollars and then the units would be trillions um, in parentheses. Um, and uh, yeah, so, okay, so, so fair the point. The income, the ratio is weird too. Ah, like so you're talking about the x-axis? Yeah. Yeah. So what's weird about it? It doesn't have a uniform range. They like made yes. it up. Yes. 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 So the term here is deception. So the first, uh, the first um, bar on the far left is people making no money. Okay. So that's that's zero dollars width, which is kind of weird. The next bar is people making one to five thousand dollars a year. Okay, so that, that bar is $5,000 wide. 
The next one is 5 to 10. That's also 5,000. The next one, 10 to 15, 5,000. 15 to 20, okay, okay. So here we're being okay. The things are kind of seeming fair. Um, and then we get up to um, uh, 25 to 30. And then 30 to 40, suddenly now each bar is $10,000. And then 40 to 50, 10,000. And then the next bar is 25,000. And then another 25,000. Then the next bar is 100,000. And so it is not uniform in any way, shape, or form. And this is an intentional deception because they know you will think this is a, a traditional figure, which should go on the x-axis from low to high. And so they're, they're assuming that you just glance at this and you say, oh my gosh, the highest bar is in the middle. Therefore, oh my gosh, these horrible people are going to are gonna make the middle class pay all the taxes. What jerks, right? If we take this same exact data and graph it fairly, consistently, it looks like this, right? So the highest taxpayers are not, as the op-ed argued, the middle class. It's, they're not gonna soak the middle. It is indeed the folks that were paying the most, um, or the people that, that um, uh, have the most taxable income are the wealthiest. Shocker, shocker, shocker. Right, so um, that's an example of folks intentionally hoping that you're um, not paying attention, that you're sloppy, that you're not, that you're just glancing at stuff. And there is a ton of stuff out there these days that is like that. You will not do that for Capstone. You guys are scientists. You guys are robust. You guys are going to uh, make sure that stuff is fair um, and and a, an objective um, presentation of the data. Even though we're trying to make our, our hypotheses clear, we're not trying to deceive people the way. Uh, a Wall Street Journal op-ed is. Okay, here's another example. So, um, okay, so here the argument of from this news story was that young workers uh, like to go work for Facebook and Apple and Google. And this is this is the support they offered up. Is this, if I glance at this, is this easily consumed? Do you guys, do you guys buy it that, that uh, this is a good way to present um, where young people in 2011 wanted to go work? No, it doesn't even give us the age range. Oh, okay. So yeah. So so what is young, what is a young professional? Okay. Okay. Anything else about the day? So, so is this is it was it easy to just glance at this, or do you have to kind of sort of dive into this a bit? You have to dive because there's so many lines and so many numbers. It's not easily consumable. Yeah. So this is the kind of stuff that we tend to produce when we're used when you and I are used to being buried in our data. And we're looking all the time and all the time and all the time and all the time. And then we're like, oh my gosh, let's graph this. And then we throw it up. And um, and it's just because we're so familiar with it, we of course notice the subtleties. Random people that first come to our data, which is essentially everybody that'll be looking at your data, um, they don't have that background. And so so it helps to try some some crutches, right? So one crutch is we, we one crutch would be to try to make this graphical, perhaps. Maybe this is helpful, um, maybe not, um, but this might be an improvement, but we can continue to refine. And what we'll see with all of our figures, just like you're writing, the idea here is to constantly be refining, refining, refining. So make this on Monday, tweak it on Tuesday, tweak it on Wednesday and constantly make it better. So here's another example. So here's a merging of those the couple iterations um, uh, that some of our students made uh, in a, a while ago. And so this is all the same data, but now is it clear that, that Google and Apple and Facebook are the, are the most popular picks? Yeah, it's better because it's more like visualized. Yeah, it's all the this, this this same percentages are there, right? The ranks are still there. Google's number one, Apple's number two, Facebook's number three. Um, so, but, but thinking a little bit about design, I'm not trying to deceive anyone here, not trying to trick anyone, but, but this is helping lead them through. So when people are glancing at your poster, when they're walking through the poster session, they can glance up here and, and get the main takeaway pretty quickly. Cool? Okay. Okay. So um, how about this? What do you guys think about this? this uh, so this was from a recent article talking about the effect of chat GPT on, um, on uh, 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 freelancers, people that get hired to do... Uh, you know, write copy or or do art or that kind of stuff for for magazines and and uh, and companies and stuff. Is this easy to understand? Or is this is this straightforward? What do you guys think? I think it's pretty clear. Um, just because the of the large divide that's in the center that separates the before and the after, I think that is really effective in 
showing the difference versus if it was like two different graphs and then you would have to kind of like put it next to each other. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think it's effective. And so so um, we don't know what the what the what the pink fuzz is. That's a measure of error. Um, the red dots are, are the central tendency or the mean, but that's not that's not fully labeled. That's because this comes from a, a study that the newspaper um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, copied and modified. Um, but but, you know, sh sure, you could do an X, Y plot. But maybe it's nicer to have like all four quadrants, you know, the, the positives and the negatives, et cetera. And in this case, it's all standardized. So everything was standardized to, um, you know, how things are relative. So that's what the zero is. So zero is no change. So the solid horizontal black line is if if the folks were making the same amount of money or, or had the same number of jobs. And so so we can go ahead and, and change our, our layout of our figures to emphasize um, the hypothesis we're trying to to test. Cool. How about this one? This one is from just a couple days ago. Uh, so the argument here is that uh, uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter um, is chundering, right? Is losing it, is imploding. Um, and, and this, again, is all relative to a start date. So everything's made uh, relative to the start time, which is 0% change. So do you do you buy this? Is does this uh, does Elon Musk that says oh things are going great? Is that does that seem to be supported with this? No. <laughs> no. Right. Okay. So there you go. So so in this case they also have added some color to help um, maybe emphasize something and make even even the declining line, which probably would have been obvious in its, in itself, to make it stand out even more. Right. Which would be the core hypothesis here in this particular uh, that, that, that these folks are trying to present. And then one last one before we get into theory. How about this? So, uh, so what's going on with is ice cover normal in uh, in the Great Lakes uh, these days? I think that it's helpful to see that blue line right there, where it was a historical average, and you see that there's a lot of lines that are much greater than that. But I don't know. I feel like maybe it's a little busy. I don't know if there's a better way of visualizing it, just because it is still really like distracting. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else thoughts? Good, bad, indifferent? I think I think it's it's pretty effective. Um, but the, my initial impression was that the 2023-2024 data was like really small, which I mean, um, it helps the point that they're trying to uh, put out there. But it's just uh, it was hard to notice that in the beginning. Okay. So in some cases, you're going to want to um, present your summary statistics. And sometimes you want to present your raw your raw data, and that's going to depend on your hypothesis, going to depend on your setting. In this case, they're doing both, right? So in this case, they're presenting all the data of all the years since 1973, and that's the those are the light gray traces in the background. And then there's the 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 central tendency was that which is the historic average, the the blue line. And then it's this year. And so I would argue, I think this is this is. I think this is pretty effective because even though there's a lot of scatter in there, you know, this is decades worth of stuff. And even though we're looking at decades worth of, of, um, of values, right? Like 50, half a century of, of, of years, 2023 is at the very, very bottom, right? For, you know, it wasn't, it's not kind of sort of in the low part. It literally is on the bottom. It's tracing the bottom of that. So um, I would argue that that um, you can layer data like this, right? And we can we can make something maybe di a di different color to make it sort of recess into the background, and so it's not a, a major visual distraction, but yet it's still there to provide support or or to refute um, whatever we're trying to uh, to test. Cool. All right. So let's talk about what makes uh, any questions about those examples. Anybody? All right, so um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what makes something effective graphically. And uh, Brenton and Claire, you guys just tell me to shut up if I'm going too long, or you guys need to do something else. No, you're doing good. Thanks. Okay, so um, so let's look at some. So these are some of my favorite uh, some examples of some of my favorite graphs. This is one of the um, most famous historic graphs, and so this is um, from William Playfair's um, analysis of um, a trade imbalance. And so this really is one of the main reasons why we put dates on the bottom 
on, on the x-axis. This is one of the first times that we did that. And so essentially we're going from 17, you know, back in the day, in this case, 1700, to more recent times on the x-axis. And then what we're showing here is um, if we are um, uh, exporting more goods to uh, Denmark and Norway, or if we're importing more goods uh, to England from Denmark and Norway. And so what, he, what he's done here is he's, he's made um, the line of imports here. You guys can see my cursor, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So, so the, the red line here is the line of imports and, it, and it's, it's, he's tracked it over time and it's, and it's um, uh, uh, sorry, this is, this is imports, the yellow is the imports. And then exports is in red. And then he had the innovate, there's many innovations there, but one of the other innovations is, hey, we can color in this volume, which is the difference between the import and the exporting. And that creates a really strong uh, visual cue, but then also he's labeled it. So in addition to that, he's gone and he said, this one is against uh, the UK, if you're thinking about the, the UK trying to make a bunch of sales and stuff, right? It's against the UK, uh, they're, not, they're not doing that well. Here, England is doing better in terms of um, uh, 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 selling more of its product to, uh, to its friends, Denmark and Norway. So this is 1786. So when you guys are struggling to make graphs, right? Um, go ahead and sketch it out, draw it out. Don't start with, with something in a, in a, on a computer screen or a browser, sketch it out. I think I wanna show this and this and this. And, and those are always tools that you have available to you. And then you can start to work on, on how to uh, make the program do what you want in your head. And people have been doing this for hundreds of years. Okay, so great graphs, well-designed graphs are gonna be, generally speaking, data dense. I understand that all you guys are like, well, we don't have much data, but as dense as you can make it. That density allows readers to explore more alternatives. What if? So it, you know, your, your, your core hypothesis is in there, but there might be additional stuff. So then after they answer that hypothesis, hey, I wonder if that I wonder if is facilitated by having uh, uh, more data on there or more other variables. Um, great graphs should have an obvious conclusion, right? So in this case, it's, it's over time, we started with England doing a lot of importing of goods. And now more recently, it's, it's doing a lot of exporting of goods and we're doing more exporting than imports, right? So that should be a pretty clear conclusion. Um, ideally, uh, well, this isn't all of our work, but ideally um, a cause or effect, or at least a, a, a strong relationship. Uh, we should also uh, keep what we're doing free of so-called chart junk, which is a lot of stuff that things like PowerPoint and all these automated things will just throw on your graphs. A lot of times we don't need those and those just get in the way. So great approach is to go ahead, make your graph and then start to see how many things can I take away and still have the full clarity of it. And that'll tend to focus people on the data, focus people on the, the testing. Um, and then ideally a great graph is elegant, right? So it should really be um, aesthetically pleasing. It should be this really nice thing that's really easy to read. And, and that's a hard one that comes with experience, but, but the more we can work towards that, the more powerful our graphs will be. So I used to take uh, you guys all to a presentation by this guy um, uh, named Edward Tufte. That's the guy on the left. Uh, he's a professor, uh, statistician, and artist. And he is one of the original gurus of what we now call, what's become called data viz. Um, and so I used to take the class every year to one of his um, one of his presentations. And he would show things like a textbook from the Renaissance that had three-dimensional visualizations in space, like pop up, pop up, pop up um, geometry and stuff that you can still use today. So really elegantly designed uh, presentation of data and 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 really cool stuff. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to show you next is is comes from uh, reading uh, Tufty and 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 having I've been strongly influenced by him. But anyway, so um, okay, so how do we make a great a graph? Um, show the data, right? So, so show me the data. Don't tell me, but but actually put it up there and, and put it into our two-dimensional state space or whatever our figure is. We'd like to induce the viewer to think about what's going on, to think about these relationships. That said, we don't want to do what the Wall Street Journal op-ed did, was, which was distort. We don't want to intentionally mislead people. We don't want to screw with the, 
the different sizes of categories. We don't want to select just a subset of the data. We want to show the full range, et cetera. Generally speaking, um, uh, one way you can get data density is to have many numbers in a small space, but that doesn't always work. Um, but it, but as, a, as a starter, it, it, that, that's sort of a good thing. I think sometimes you guys get a little bit um, uh, uh, overwhelmed by that and you think that's bad. It actually is, is usually very helpful for people doing those what if questions. Um, a really uh, excellently designed graph can make large data sets or complex data sets really coherent. And they really encourage Again, that what if. So, so let me compare this thing to that. Even if it wasn't what you originally intended or what your, your paper or your poster is about, it allows the audience to start to do their own explorations. Um, uh, really great graphs uh, reveal um, a lot of levels of detail. Um, that could be from summary statistics or other things. It should have a really clear purpose. And I'm showing this because I want to look at the effect of this variable on that. So it should have a very clear goal in mind. Um, and, uh, also in, 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 uh, Professor Spees and Steele, uh, might have their own suggestions, but how I was raised, um, was we should be able to read the text of our thesis or the text of our poster, um, and take away, not maybe saying, maybe every single point, but take away the key main points. So just the words, key points. Okay. I understand this thing is significant. This thing isn't. The same thing with our data visualization. You should be able to look at that without reading any of the text and take away the key um, uh, uh, core uh, hypothesis or the, or the core thing. So they reinforce each other when we have a, a you know text written about the data and a visual presentation of the data. But, but when well done, they reinforce each other. And again, like I mentioned before, it'd be great to, to make sure we're doing elegant stuff. Now we have lots of formats. Does that make sense, you guys? Any questions so far? I'm talking a lot here. Okay. Um, so you have a lot of options. You have a ton of options, and um, you could do a table. You could do a map. You could do a you know bar chart. You could do all kinds of stuff. So there's various flow charts out there you can look at as to what is the best um, sort of family of uh, visualizations to look at. And they, and there's many of them out there. Some are based on um, what the data is like. Some is based on what the pattern of the data is like, et cetera. But suffice it to say, if you're having a hard time, you can talk to um, uh, any of us, your advisor, uh, your, your faculty, whoever, and they can help you uh, through this. I'll just say real briefly, we're not talking about maps here. Maps are kind of their own beast. That's why we have a whole class on GIS. And that's why we think about uh, talk about, you know, graphing theory and, and mapping theory and, and geospatial um, perceptions. Um, important if you are doing a map to make sure you fully orient your viewer and um, and that we usually are using pattern detection, pattern perception to figure out how to interpret those figures. So for example, in this, this case, stomach cancer um, from uh, 1950 to um, the uh, time we sent uh, the Apollo up to the moon. Um, and the idea here is uh, just looking at this map, we can see some clusters, right? So we can see there's there's this, this um, pale cluster up here, kind of by the Great Lakes, and then out here in the Southwest uh, with women, but not, and, and kind of with men, but not quite the same. And the, the clustering is a little bit different with men. So so when we're doing maps, we're usually trying to look for that spatial pattern or communicate some trend in a spatial pattern. So for example, here is a recent um, figure from the Lahaina wildfires, same thing, right? So in this case, the, the, the um, polygons represent um, buildings that were in existence at the start of August 2023, and then the reds, uh, red color represents ones that were destroyed. And so we start to look at this, we can start to get a sense of how um, the level of patchiness, for example, that that natural disaster uh, uh, brought forth on that community. Okay, so maps are their own kind of beast. Okay. So next, let's talk about graphs. So there's a whole variety of graphs that you could um, choose from, things like dot plots and whisker plots and histograms, etc. Um, a dot plot is, here's an example of a dot plot. Here's an example of a whisker plot. And some of these have various names. So they're, 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 sometimes there are three or four or five different common names for these things. A histogram, looking at the distribution of stuff, a bar chart or a bar graph, scatter plot, um, a, a traditional line graph, and then something like a stacked 
uh, bar graph. So these are the most popular ones that, that you all in Capstone over the last 20 years have, have uh, typically used in your data presentation. Um, uh, if you are trying to look at um, variability and you're trying to communicate variability, you should think about something like a dot plot, a box and whisker, or a histogram. And those are really good when we have a categorical variable and a numerical variable. Um, yeah, I'll say that. Um, uh, we want to compare groups. Um, uh, uh, frequency plots can be helpful, but bar graphs are, are probably the most popular ones um, when we have a single number for each group. And so in this case, this is a, um, a horizontal bar, uh, bar chart, bar graph, um, and uh, very useful when we have two or more categorical variables and one numerical variable. Um, when we're trying to correlate stuff, and that's a really popular thing that you guys are trying to do. Hey, what if what does the what is this location or how far up the coast is this compared to that? That type of deal. Scatter plot is um, is a very popular one. We want to look at uh, one group versus another group, or one factor versus another factor. Um, line charts or line graphs are good when we only want to show a single number. Um, uh, you know, same thing, X versus Y, but we're trying to track one particular thing. Um, and these are these are when we have numerical values, both uh, for the first variable and the second variable. Um, and and we're just things are sh a shotgun dot out. That's a scatter plot. When something um, is is related to another variable in the classical one would be time um, or distance. That's when we want to use um, a line, uh, a, a line as opposed to a scatter plot uh, to show that. Um, okay, so for proportion or comparisons, which is another very common one you guys do. Um, now, I'll, I'll let your, your faculty say how to do that. I'll just say, for me, none of my students are allowed to make a pie chart because pie charts suck. They're really horrible, and then they're bad, and then they suck, and then they're horrible, and then they're really, really bad, and then they're massively deceptive. So uh, all the research shows that when people try to interpret data from pie charts other than 50% or half or or a third, two thirds, um, which is the vast majority of our stuff does not fall in those categories. People always get the estimation wrong. Um, and you can ask me why that is, but but suffice it to say, um, bar charts, bar graphs are much better for that than, than a, a pie chart. Um, yeah, so I'll just say that. So so this is great when we're, we're trying to display all kinds of aspects of information that is proportional. Um, Again, you have lots of different options to choose from. And, and uh, the cool thing is, go ahead and try it a couple different ways and show it to, to me or, or, or Professor Spees or, or Professor Steele or whoever you want. And, and we can give you guys a lot of uh, feedback. And there's no problem with trying something version A, version B, version C, and start to figure it out from there. When you want it, what should I be including on my data visualization figures? Um, obviously, the data is there. In some cases, like I mentioned, you want the raw data. In some cases, you want the summary data. And in some cases, you want both, right? But do it intentionally. Don't just barf some random data out into the some program and click graph. Um, where I see this most commonly is when you guys attempt to do error bars and you don't know how to calculate error bars and you throw it into the program and it calculates a completely erroneous, not correct value, but it will, it'll make something come out on the, on, onto the um, screen and you think, oh, that's great. Be intentional. Um, uh, make sure we have the, the labels there that include both what the variable is and the, the thing that we quantify, the units. Um, and then uh, we'd really like to see, in most cases, second order information. So that would be uh, trend lines, things of that nature. And then once we have that, once we've crafted that, the next thing is, is, is and you're happy with it, and it's, it's uh, you know, cor correct the way uh, in, the, in the big picture, then work on taking away stuff. So remove this. What if I change that? What if I, do I need a, a line on the top, right, left, and bottom of my figure? Or do I need just a line on the left side and the bottom side, right? Try it both ways. Try taking away stuff. Um, another common one we get is, should I use a table or a graph? And so have a look at this, you guys. So, so um, unmute and tell me what you think here. This is the same data. This is the same data. This is this is looking at the efficacy of a of a of, of some drugs versus a placebo or a control. And uh, what do you think? You guys, you guys like the graphical version of the data on the right, or do you like the tabular version on the left? What do you think? Graph. Okay, who's that? Jonathan says graph. Okay, and why, Jonathan? Why? 
Oh, uh, it's easier to like visualize, and you can also see like the mean mm -hmm. of the placebo versus the drug one. It, like it's the okay, cool. I like the the right side. Just I mean, it looks more aesthetically pleasing, but I feel like on the left. I can actually gauge what it's talking about. Like I do gotta stare a little bit longer, but having the actual numbers there, I feel like it's easier for me to understand. But the right is more aesthetically pleasing. Like that looks cool. You know what I mean? Like that would catch your eye quicker <laughs> right. than the one on the left. But right, the left right, right, right. Like more useful. Cool. Anybody else? No. Everybody's like, yeah, whatever. I'm asleep. Um, so, so yeah, so I would say definitely. So if we have a poster or we're doing a, an oral presentation, we only have like a, you know, a minute or two with someone or whatever. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I agree with your guys comments. The one on the right is, is nice and clear and it shows, oh my gosh, this, um, this, um, uh, drug is or isn't effective. Uh, right. So the, so the, the, the real drug is, it has a higher, um, efficacy or, or resolved, um, symptoms, but excuse me, better than the placebo. So that's cool. And you get a sense of how much overlap there is and the range and all that kind of stuff. So that's great. Um, so if I was doing this as, again, in a, in a conference, I would probably do that, as you guys said, the one on the right. If, however, I was a researcher and I was trying to understand very detailed which one is up uh, or, 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 or trying to interpret the data in terms of my own analysis and, and trying to figure out what it might mean to me or my research, Actually, the guy on the left, the table is a little bit better because I can actually go up and look at the specific quantity, the exact value of that particular drug and this particular treatment and all this and that. So the point there is um, they're both valuable, but in a different way, right? So, so um, and, and it's okay if you're not sure, make a table, make a figure and, and compare them both. Maybe you have the table in your thesis, your written thesis, and you use the the um, visualization in your thesis as well, or maybe you just use that in the poster, right? So, so that's okay. So again, try, give yourselves options and then check those guys out. Um, generally speaking, tables are best when you want to be able to look up a specific value, specific piece of information, when you need to report that very um, specifically. And then graphs are better, better when we want to just show the overall trends or we want to compare this category versus that category. Um, uh, and so, uh, when would we use a table versus a graph? So if we have independent and dependent variables that are qualitative, um, or quantitative, uh, tables can do, uh, uh both, um, there, uh, the number of data points that we, uh, show, um, is, is a bit more usually in a graphical version, whereas a table, we just get overwhelmed once we start to get above, you know, 20, 30 numbers kind of thing. Sometimes you need to, but, but generally speaking, we can get more data crammed into a visualization and elegantly get it in there than r relative to a table. Um, if we do have more than one independent variable, then the graph tends to be a better, uh, a better option if we're deciding between the two. Um, and if we're trying to represent the distribution of the data with error bars and stuff like that, definitely a visualization, definitely a graph is going to be better than a table in that context. Um, and uh, if if we if what, for whatever reason we really really want to make sure that the reader can see, um, maybe these these are particular um, you know communities with experiencing environmental injustice or something like that. If there's something on the order of ten or less. Uh, variables that we really want people to see, um, uh, uh, a table is good. If we start getting more than that, a graph is better. Uh, the new wave of, in the last couple of years, of doing interactive visualizations, so on blogs and things like that, actually can help solve this, but but uh, that can be one of your determinants. And then um, and then if, if you're trying to show, show the overall trend or just sort of report out what happened in this particular part of your um, experiment, that that could uh, have an influence. Um, if you do make a table, uh, make sure that the, the, you sort the table mean, meaningfully. Don't just barf up. And the same goes for labeling your axes. Make sure that it makes sense. Uh, something like geographically, something like um, 
uh, the structure of the compounds or something. Sort that stuff, not just what is alphabetical, not just what's random in your table or how you've always been sorting it, but make sure it, it, there's an there's a organizing principle into how we put those variables up. Um, uh, you want to use rates or portions or proportions in addition to uh, totals, and sometimes you want to use those instead of totals. Um, uh, similar data should be compared downwards, so listed in columns as opposed to across horizontally. Um, you may want to highlight important comparisons, maybe by making the background of that of that row, let's say gray and another row gray, or or a darker yellow and a lighter yellow, something like that. And then, um, as always, when you have a table, make sure that you're going to show the source. So this comes from my experiment one, or or something of that nature. Okay, so let's look at a couple more examples and then and then I'll probably uh, shut up. Uh, but uh, this is a really cool uh, figure. Have you, has anybody seen this before? Nobody. Oh my God, look at look at how look at how uh, how much I like this figure because over my closet, can you guys see that? Over my closet uh, is a copy of that. That's how much that's how much uh, I like that. I can't I can't do this when I'm in class because I can't. Nobody believed me, but um, love this. This is great. So this is one of the the best uh, data visualizations ever in the history of people, I, I would argue, and many other people have argued. Okay, so um, what are we looking at? So uh, does anybody speak French? Nobody speaks French? Okay. No. So this is... I do, but so, it's too tiny. <laughs> this is, and it's written in like 200-year-old handwriting. So, okay, so this is... Um, a very famous presentation. If you look at anything on the history of data visualizations, they'll probably have this in here. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at um, the quantitative discussion of Napoleon's attempt to invade Russia. So um, there's there's so much stuff going on here. It's, it's hard to explain. We're just, we'll just touch on it really briefly though. So um, we have these things here. We have these this beige uh, uh, sort of liney kind of stuff. Then we have a black kind of bulky liney thing, right? Uh, and then we have uh, this uh, down here. We have a temperature graph down here. And okay, so there's actually six different variables being displayed here at once, right? Again, this is early 18, or this is this is created in the late 1800s, but right way before PowerPoint, way before ArcGIS, and and this was this was really awesome. What are we looking at? We are looking at a historical quantitative description of Napoleon's march from the Russian border to Moscow. So this is the the border over here. Okay, so so Napoleon starts out with uh, 422,000 soldiers. And the width of this bar is how many people are alive, how many people are in his, are in the ranks of his army, and so and also it's it's a it's a map. It's also a, a spatial map. So so this this reflects the actual X and Y, the Latin lawn as they're going. So here we go. So we start going dot 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 dot, dot and then a group breaks off, right? So this little contingent goes this way, and they march for a little bit longer, and the, then a group breaks off and goes this way. Um, but notice as we're going through time, not only are some groups breaking off, but look, it's getting narrower. Oop, it's got smaller. Oop, got smaller. Oop, get 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 smaller, right? So they're going, they're marching through the winter. They're getting their butts kicked by the Russian uh, climate. And it's getting, you know, so so windy and all this kind of stuff. They're getting their butt kicked, butt, butt kicked. So all this stuff is, is, is attacking them. They go, they try to sack Moscow. It doesn't work. So they're like, oh man. So by the time they get to Moscow, there's only a hundred thousand people in their army. So they've already lost about, you know, a, they're only about one fourth of what they were. And they get their butt kicked and then they retreat. So now then the black line is how they retreat back from Moscow. And people are dying, people are dying. This guy, these guys break off to, to hook up with these guys. Come on down. So by the time they get back, they started with 422,000 people. They end, they end with 10,000 people, right? So massive disaster, massive, massive failure. And that's a lot of complex stuff. That's a, that's a really complex narrative to tell, interpretation, but it can be done elegantly, right? And so it's a matter of choosing our layout, choosing how we want to represent different variables. And so if folks in the mid 1800s can do it, I'm sure you guys can do a fantastic job with telling your story as well. Here's a, here's a quick example of people trying to do something similar. In this case, this is gas uh, gas prices. And here on the x-axis, this is how many miles 
uh, the, the average American is driving per year. And this is the price of gas. And then the years are here. So just like the Napoleon March wasn't using the X axis for date, for a time, excuse me, we are, a connected line is connecting us. And so uh, this is telling us a story about the price of gas and all that kind of stuff. Um, how about this? How about this? Do you, what do you guys think about this figure? So this is a, a much more simpler thing. We're talking about um, two species of fish in a lake. What do you guys think is going on in this lake? One species when, uh, the other. Sorry, yeah, you guys were talking over. Yes, yeah, say again. Um, that one species is um, overtaking the other. The rainbow smelt seems to be kicking the yellow perch's butt kind of thing, right? So cool. So there's no It looks more like that after the yellow perch died, the rainbow smelt started overpopulating because it had more resources. Could be, yeah. So 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 there's something that changes in the early 90s and uh, the once common yellow perch uh, is no more and the once rare rainbow smelt becomes very uh a common, right? So there's no label here. There's no text explaining what's going on, but just with a well-labeled figure, we can get a sense that there's been some ecological shift, right? In this, this case, in terms of the, the um, fishing uh, uh, catch per unit effort of, of people fishing on that lake. And so there's no reason why you guys can't add a symbol, um, you know, can't add some text there uh, into the actual graphical plane itself, as opposed to only quote unquote in the in the legend. So you can do stuff like that. Here's another example. In this case, this is a, this is a mapping approach. In this case, this is looking at um, artifacts where where um, uh, things came from museum collections from Native American peoples, where they came from, etc. So we're looking at both spatial as well as overlaid um, uh, sort of a chloropath type of approach. Um, here's something that's way complicated. This is too complicated for most of you guys, but this would be an example of something where some where someone maybe wants to stare at the data and communicate a lot of stuff in, in, um, uh, and give people to do really in-depth explorations of data. That's probably not you guys. Here's another example looking at how many roads there are in the U.S., right? And so, so without, without much uh, preamble, I think this is pretty straightforward, right? So we have our x-axis labeled. The variable is distance from a road. The units are in meters. And then on the uh, y-axis, it's the amount of land that is, um, uh, uh, what proportion of the total land is within whatever, however many meters from a road. And so um, this, this both says that there's a lot of land close to roads in the U.S., but it also allows you to say, hey, how much land is, a, is, is you know, within a kilometer of a road, you know? Almost, you know, 70 some odd percent of our land is within a kilometer of road in the lower 48 states, et cetera. So you can do your own data exploration with this data set. Um, another example of a st stacked bar graph, where we're trying to rank stuff. Uh, in this case, we've ranked them from the highest value to, to the lowest. That's how the, the things have been labeled here, as opposed to some alphabetical or something like that. Um, here's an example from a capstone project looking at the, the um, effect of the marine protected area out on Santa Rosa Island on a fish. Um, uh, on one side of our pier in the MPA, on another side that's not. And so here they've, they've labeled their error bars and we're looking at how many uh, meters away from the pier we're seeing this. Um, here's an, another example, another historic example of folks that didn't have any PowerPoint, didn't have anything, but could create an effective graph. And so this is W.B. Du Bois, the famous scholar um, and civil rights activist. And so in this case, uh, was looking at 150 different families in the Atlanta area and wondering how they were, how their um, uh, money was being um, used in any given month. And so we have it doesn't really matter what it is. In this case, this is rent. In this, in this category, black is rent. Purple is food, clothes, et cetera. And so we can start to say, hey, for folks that were in this low income, this was their breakdown. Folks are in this higher economic bracket, this was their breakdown, and so on and so forth. So very straightforward to sort of step back and sort of look and see, oh my gosh, the, the folks that were lower income spend a much larger fraction of their income on, in this case, rent, right? So... Um, so in this case, compare, combining our traditional um, 
quantitative graphing with some layered interpretation on there. There's no reason why you guys couldn't do that type of an approach uh, with your uh, with some of your data. Um, so uh, I think uh, there's some other examples, but I'll just I'll pause there.